нас тогда громче. Окей. Как лучше смотреть? First of all, good morning to everybody. Uh, you will be speaking English? Uh, is it okay to speak in English? Uh, yeah. Uh, you know, um, in principle, some lectures will be in English, some lectures will be in Russian. So, but I guess all of you, to some extent, know English, and that's not a really problem. Let's walk. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, let me try also to ask you, uh, can you hear me without a microphone? Probably you can hear. I think the microphone will not help me to handle the blackboard. Okay, so uh, it's a great pleasure uh, to be the first lecturer at the first uh, summer school uh, of the new, uh, newly uh, founded uh, foundation basis. And uh, I would like uh, to thank all the organizers uh, and also the founder of this uh, uh, foundation uh, for inviting me uh, to talk uh, at this school. So, uh, I will be talking about quantum field theory, and uh, let me uh, make a statement uh, from the very beginning that quantum field theory, in uh, my opinion, and not, not only in my opinion, is one of the uh, uh, greatest achievement of theoretical physics in 20th century. So, quantum field theory arose, as you might know, uh, from an attempt uh, to merge uh, two uh, already existing and experimentally verified theories, quantum mechanics and the theory of special relativity. And uh, today uh, we know that quantum field theory uh, stands under precision tests in numerous uh, colliding experiments, uh, for instance, in the Large Hadron Collider at CERN and also in uh, uh, Fermilab uh, in the USA. And uh, I also should point out right away uh, that um, uh, quantum field theory uh, has a universal uh, character. Uh, the methods of quantum field theory are universal and they are applicable not only to uh, theory of elementary particles, but also, for instance, uh, uh, for uh, theoretical condensed matter. That's why it's very important to understand basic principles and the basic ideas about uh, quantum fields. And so I see uh, my role in this school as uh, uh, to introduce you some basic uh, concepts uh, of uh, quantum field theory. And uh, today uh, is the first lecture and I would like to talk about uh, symmetries uh, in uh, classical field theory and uh, symmetries in quantum field theory. So, symmetries. Uh, why symmetries are important? Symmetries are important uh, because uh, the nature is very uh, great, uh, gratifying to us in a sense that if you know uh, the loss of nature at one point of space-time, then you know them also in the other point of space-time. So the laws of nature are not random from point to point, they are related. Also, if you uh, have the laws of nature at one point and uh, in one direction, then you can look in the other direction also ask it, uh, the question if the laws of nature are the same in a different direction or they are different. And uh, as I told you, uh, the nature is such that if you know the laws in one point, then you know them at any other. And that is essentially uh, what, uh, what is the role of symmetries uh, in our world. Now, in order to uh, set up uh, the discussion, I need uh, to tell you some basic uh, things about, uh, about classical fields. And uh, let me probably start from mentioning that uh, uh, in uh, Classical field theory, we start uh, from the description of a theory in terms of uh, uh, actions. Uh, let me see. How can I use the blackboard? So I need all the blackboards which you have here. So let me take this one here. And let me also take this one. So, this 
is for, for the chalk, right? And this is for the lamp. Very good. So let's see. <coughs> So, uh, we start from the action principle. So, uh, if we have a dynamical system, uh, which uh, essentially is described by a set of uh, fields, I denote them collectively uh, by the letter phi with an index i. And uh, I assume that these fields depend on a point x, where x will be the space-time point time point. And then uh, the action, which describes a dynamical system, uh, will always be assumed to be an integral. Uh, in general, let's assume that we consider our fields in d dimensions. So differential dx uh, will be understood as a product of differentials dx0, dx1, and so on up to dx d minus 1. Uh, integral over the space-time of a Lagrangian density, which I denote by L, and this Lagrangian density is assumed to be a local function of fields phi i x and of their uh, first space-time derivatives. Now, uh, from the action principle, which is a principle of uh, the least action or Mercury principle, if you wish, uh, you can find uh, equations of motion which describes the dynamical evolution of the system. So for that, you need uh, to find the variational derivative of the action with respect to the fields. And uh, if you vary this quantity here and you drop the boundary terms, uh, uh, you will find uh, the following equation. Variational derivative, for, this is a normal derivative of the Lagrangian density over the fields minus uh, derivative uh, mu derivative of the Lagrangian with respect to d mu by i on x equals to z. And these are the fundamental equations uh, which are known under the name the Euler-Lagrange equations. So this is a starting point for the Lagrange equations. This, is, this will be our starting point uh, to discuss uh, the formalism of classical field theory and later on quantum uh, field theory. Any questions here? Is it what I'm saying uh, very unusual to you or you have seen that? So basically, uh, this uh, description uh, of the theory is a description of a mechanical system, if you wish, with infinite number of degrees of freedom. The infinite number of degrees of freedom is comprised by this field phi x, and x here can be understood as a label, uh, and since x is continuous, you deal essentially with uh, infinite number of degrees of freedom labeled by this variable x. So raise your hand who understands what I'm talking about here. Yeah. Uh, perfect. Okay. Very good. How, how important is those assumptions that you draw out for this new uh, full derivative? Yeah, I will, I, will, I will say it in a moment. Uh, this is what I'm trying, uh, what I will be talking now about. So um, if you change uh, the Lagrangian by adding to it, uh, the uh, total derivative term, like this one, uh, then it appears that uh, the Euler-Lagrange uh, equations, which derive uh, from this new Lagrangian, do not change. You change the Lagrangian by the total derivative, but the equations of motion uh, will not change. So um, here, uh, let me assume, because uh, it's very easy to show that this is indeed the case, so uh, let me... Uh, assume uh, that uh, 
uh, my variable uh, lambda mu is a function of the field spy i only. Uh, that is because I don't want to change the nature of my Lagrangian. I assume that my Lagrangian contains only uh, first derivatives of the field phi i. And uh, this is, uh, uh, simplifies my discussion because I would like to discuss only unitary theories. And for unitary theories, Lagrangian typically depends only on the first derivative of the field. Um, so in order not to destroy this nature of the Lagrangian to depend only on the first derivative, I will assume that this addition lambda also depends on the field phi r. Now, if you continue a little bit this equation here, so if you write down explicitly uh, this uh, derivative uh, as a derivative of the composite function, so you write this equation like derivative uh, of the Lagrangian with respect to uh, uh, the field uh, phi, let's say, phi j, uh, like this. Um, uh, d mu by j minus uh, second derivative uh, of Lagrangian uh, with respect to d phi j mu uh, d phi i uh, d uh, mu by j, then uh, this is an explicit, uh, if you wish, very explicit form of the equations of motion. Uh, so what I have done, I just differentiate uh, this function here uh, as a composite function. So this uh, Lagrangian density here is a function of the field and its derivative. And so this is what I have done here. I differentiate Lagrangian first with respect to the field, and then field with respect to space-time point. And here I differentiate Lagrangian with respect uh, to uh, uh, derivative of the field and then derivative of the field with respect to the space-time point. So explicitly, uh, well, in the Lagrange equation, you see that this is nothing else is a partial, non-linear differential equation. And so essentially, uh, a lot uh, depends on our ability to solve such kind of equations, partial non-linear differential equations. Unfortunately, uh, our mathematical colleagues are not so uh, far with uh, solving the general problems of this type. Typically, partial nonlinear differential equations are very, very complicated, and we don't know how to find general solutions. In any, in any way, uh, we continue first with this concept of the Euler Lagrange equations. And uh, uh, yeah, I'm sorry, wasn't that, wasn't that the Euler Gelfand's remark? The partial differential equations are useful. They are beautiful. For the yeah. reason that they are not solvable in general. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I, uh, I can add to the statement that, uh, yeah, among that equations, of course, uh, there is a set of equations which you can solve exactly, and it leads to the notion of integrability, integrable models, and so on and so forth. But in general, in quantum field theory, unfortunately, <clears throat> we don't know much about how uh, to solve such equations. Uh, in any case, uh, uh, people found an ingenious way how to overcome this problem and not really to concentrate uh, on, on the partial differential equation, but go away and uh, uh, build up the formalism of quantum field theory without uh, talking at this, uh, at this point here. Anyhow, anyhow, my statement is that if you now substitute uh, in this equation here, instead of Lagrangian L, you substitute the quantity uh, d nu lambda nu, so you replace L by d nu lambda nu, then you can check that uh, this quantity here will turn out to zero uh, automatically. Just make this, this is a little exercise, we can do it in exercise class, so you will write this uh, uh, expression here also as a derivative of the composite function, so you differentiate it with respect to the field phi, and then you differentiate phi uh, with respect to the space-time point. Then you take this uh, expression here, substitute it instead of uh, lambda, uh, sorry, substitute instead of L here, and you will see that this uh, left-hand side will be automatically satisfied. It will turn into zero uh, identically. 
Good. So this is a Lagrangian, uh, Euler-Lagrange equations, and uh, this is uh, all what I need in order to discuss, in order to approach uh, the uh, description of symmetries in classical field. Now, um, the topic which I would like uh, to discuss now is the so-called Nota, the first Nota theorem. In general, even if we would be able to solve such partial nonlinear uh, equations, uh, then uh, we will not get the full description of this theory. Because uh, in addition uh, to these uh, equations and its solutions, what we would like to know, we would like also to know the so-called dynamical invariance. Dynamical invariance. Dynamical invariance are the quantities uh, which are stay uh, intact during uh, the time evolution of the system. In other words, dynamical invariants are quantities which are conservation laws. Uh, which are conservation laws. So dynamics is non-trivial. Fields somehow uh, develop in time. They undergo non-trivial evolution according to this dynamical equation. But there are some quantities which are constructed uh, in terms of these uh, field variables, field by r and its derivatives, such that during the time evolution, these quantities remain to be the same. Do you know examples of such quantities? Conservation laws? Energy. Energy? Well, Something else? Mm -hmm. Momentum? Yes. Yes. So this is uh, typical examples of dynamical environments. Energy, momentum. For instance, uh, you know that uh, Momentum, conservation of the momentum is related to the fact that your system exhibits invariance with respect to the space-time translations. And this is something which I studied my lecture with. I told you that the uh, laws of nature are translationally invariant. If you have them here, you can translate your system and you will find them. And the other point to be the same. Energy describes the invariance with respect to So if you make an experiment uh, at this point, and then you make the same experiment in hundreds of years, with the same initial conditions, you will find the same result. And this is precisely what conservation of energy is responsible for. So energy and momentum. And already from this very simple discussion of, uh, so to speak, uh, school examples of conservation laws, conservation of energy and momentum, you see that there is a very interesting relation between uh, symmetries, between translational invariance with respect to space and time, and between conservation laws. So symmetries imply conservation laws. And this is essential uh, point for the Nutter theorem. Symmetries imply conservation laws. Of course, uh, these fundamental uh, conservation laws, like conservation of energy and momentum, they were discovered a long, long time uh, before uh, M. S. Noether's first theorem, which actually uh, was formulated first in 1980 by M. Noether. But uh, Noether uh, understood how to apply, uh, how to describe uh, this relationship between symmetries and conservation laws in the context of field theory and in a precise mathematical language. And uh, now what I will do, I will uh, give you a formulation of the first Nutter theorem, and then I will prove I will prove this theorem. And I think this is a fundamental, first fundamental point which you would like to understand uh, when you start to study one. The so first Nutter theorem uh, is formulated in this way: to any uh, S-parametric 
continuous transformations transformation of uh, fields and uh, space-time coordinates coordinates for any uh, as parametric continuous transformation of fields and space-time coordinates there exist exactly as dynamical invariants. dynamical means uh, that these quantities uh, remain the same under the time evolution. So they do depend on the dynamical variables, but they are the same. So dynamical invariants are for me the same as conservation of C synonyms. And uh, uh, that's, uh, I haven't yet finished, uh, sorry, I haven't finished this formulation. Let me finish and then, uh, and then I will explain what is in here. To any S parametric continuous transformation of fields and space time coordinates, which, which, that is important, leave the action S invariant uh, possibly up to boundary term, possibly up to boundary term, there exists. There exists uh, S uh, conservation loss. Let's make it simple. S conservation loss. Some people uh, use the word dynamical invariance, some people use conservation loss, but they are synonymous to me. So basically, uh, this theorem tells the following. So there is a, a, a symmetry, or almost symmetry, of the action, uh, which depends on uh, S uh, parameters uh, in a continuous way. So you can make continuous transformations of your action, uh, uh, continuous transformation of your fields and space-time coordinates. And if these transformations uh, leave your action invariant, possibly up to the appearance of the boundary term, uh, like this one, uh, then you can uh, derive from this statement that there are S conservation laws. And uh, now I'm going uh, to sketch you a proof of this statement. So first of all, uh, transformation which I'm talking about is a transformation uh, which uh, transforms, might transform uh, the space-time points. So x goes to uh, some new point x prime. And uh, also field phi i x goes to some phi i prime on x prime. And accordingly to these transformations... No, they, they will form for me a group. In my, in my discussion, they will form a group. Uh, but I'm given here, I'm looking here at the... We, you will see in a second. Yeah. So uh, x goes to x prime, phi i uh, transforms, in the, uh, transforms in this way, and also uh, derivative, uh, derivative d mu phi i on x goes to d mu prime, it's a derivative with respect to x prime, to phi i prime on x prime. So this is the transformations I'm talking about. And if under this transformation uh, the action S or uh, the corresponding Lagrangian density is allowed to maximally change by adding, by changing by total derivative term like this one, then there will be S dynamical invariant. And in order to prove this theorem, uh, I will uh, consider, I will do the uh, infinitesimal analysis. Is it uh, maybe? This one. Uh, this one. This one is better. <laughs> this one is probably good. Yeah, this is. Uh, a lot of memory somehow. 
Okay, so uh, what is meant here by invariance, uh, let me write it explicitly, is that now you have an integral under the change uh, of uh, coordinates and the fields. Uh, the action takes the form dx prime of uh, Lagrangian depending now on phi prime i and d nu phi uh, prime prime uh, should be equal to dx Lagrangian original Lagrangian phi i d nu phi i no maybe by also changing by the boundary theory. In the original Nutter theorem I should point out uh, the possibility of having this boundary term uh, was not noticed, but later on, uh, uh, the student of Amy Nutter, uh, Bessel Hagen, uh, noticed this fact in 1922, that the Nutter theorem can be generalized by allowing uh, the corresponding Lagrangian density to be changed uh, by the total derivative. So it's a small generalization of the original Nutter theorem is a possibility to have this non-trivial boundary term. Anyhow. But, but the Lagrangian there is the same lambda, not lambda, not lambda prime. It's actually lambda prime. It's uh, everything it's is prime. prime. It's yeah. everything is prime here. Thank you. Yes, everything is prime. Good. So uh, let me see uh, how we uh, go with the proof. So consider infinitesimal uh, change which corresponds to uh, to this transformation here. So uh, let's write x prime to be equal to, uh, let's x prime mu to be equal x mu plus delta x mu. Delta x mu is a, uh, is a small change. And uh, we also assume that we parameterize delta x mu uh, with this s uh, parameters, namely, uh, we write it as sum uh, x mu n uh, epsilon n, and n uh, is running uh, from 1 to s. So epsilon uh, n here are parameters, parameters of the transformation. These are parameters of the transformation, and uh, these variables, x capital, these are not this little x, but these are uh, variables uh, which I write as x capital, and they do depend on two indices, on index mu of x, and also on this extra index n related to this uh, epsilon n parameters. And analogously also for the fields, delta phi i uh, is uh, delta phi i on x. Uh, we assume that this... Uh, Variation is also uh, is also parameterized by these parameters epsilon n, um, and the coefficients phi capital here, not little one, but capital, depending also on two indices i and n, epsilon n. So in general, uh, these uh, objects here, x and mu, and uh, phi i n, are functions, definite functions, which specify the transformations we are discussing. These are definite functions of uh, fields and coordinates. Fields and coordinates. And the uh, parameters epsilon nu, uh, epsilon n, uh, sorry, they are constants and uh, in a sense that they do not depend uh, on the space-time point. So just constants. Arbitrary constants. And you see from these expressions that transformations uh, delta x mu and delta phi continuously depend on these uh, S parameters epsilon. Now, uh, consider uh, the variation uh, phi prime uh, 
i on x prime. And uh, uh, we can write it in the following way. Uh, pi prime, and instead of x prime, I substitute x plus delta x, like this. And then uh, I will expand uh, this expression here into Taylor series, assuming that delta x is small, and uh, I restrict myself just uh, to the leading term. So this will be phi prime i on x, uh, plus uh, mu phi prime i on x uh, delta x mu, and essentially uh, plus dot dot dot, which is uh, phi i prime on x, plus uh, d mu phi i on x, uh, x n x capital n mu, multiplied by epsilon n plus dot dot dot. So here I allowed myself to draw prime because the difference between uh, phi and phi prime is of order epsilon, so this term would be uh, the uh, correction to this term. Uh, he, better to say, the difference between this term here and this one without prime is a further epsilon squared. So I put it somewhere here, dots, 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 which I'm not interested in. And uh, uh, an important uh, quantity which I would like to define now is the so-called uh, variation of the form of the field, which I denote not by the usual delta, by delta with a bar, and uh, I will explain in a moment why this quantity is useful. And this quantity uh, will be denote the difference, uh, will denote the difference between phi i prime on x minus phi i on x. So the point is that uh, this uh, variation delta uh, which is actually introduced here as, uh, let me define it, let me first give a definition. This is a difference between phi i prime on x prime minus phi i on x. This is by definition the quantity here. This uh, variation delta does not commute with the derivative uh, d over dx. And uh, this is uh, for the reason uh, that this variation here happens uh, because you not only vary the form of the field, like here, but you also change the space-time point. You change from x to x prime. And so the difference between these two, uh, variation delta, this is something which does not commute with uh, d over dx, because it's not clear over which variable, for instance, you have to differentiate this expression, over x over x prime, it's not clear. Well, here for the variation of the form, it's clear. The right-hand side depends only on the point x, and you can first differentiate and vary, or you can uh, first vary and then differentiate. So, uh, delta bar operation here commutes uh, with the uh, space-time derivative. Now, uh, good. Uh, with uh, these definitions here, you can actually compute what this variation equals to, because uh, here, on the left hand side you see phi prime on x prime, on the right hand side you see uh, phi prime on x, and uh, this is according to, uh, if I subtract from here, uh, okay, let me maybe write it here, so phi prime i on x prime minus phi i on x, this is by definition is delta phi i, and on the other hand, this gives me uh, the difference between phi prime on x and phi i, which is a variation delta bar, phi i on x, plus uh, d mu phi i x mu n epsilon n. And uh, this is parameterized by this expression here, which I can substitute to the left hand side, and uh, express Therefore, this uh, operation delta bar acting on phi i uh, is the following quantity. So this is phi capital i n uh, minus d mu phi i uh, little uh, x uh, mu n epsilon n. Uh, 
uh, I always, let me not to write dot, 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 I'm always restricting myself just uh, to the leading order in X. Okay, so this is an explicit uh, uh, expression for this operation delta bar. Any questions here? So what I'm trying to do, let me explain the basic idea. What I'm trying to do, I'm now trying uh, to set up uh, this variational problem. And actually, what I want to do, I want to compute the uh, difference between the left-hand side and the right-hand side. Um, you see, it's very interesting, yeah? The right-hand side is collapsing a little bit. Um, uh, in the left-hand side, what I would like to do, I would like actually to replace all prime quantities with unprimed ones by using the expressions for the corresponding variations. So this is my goal. And on this way, I will derive explicitly the expressions for this uh, concept of quantities. Okay, uh, let me continue here. Okay, uh, mm -hmm. So now uh, we come, uh, let's look now at uh, this expression here, the left hand side. So we have L prime uh, Lagrangian density uh, computed on the prime fields, but altogether this expression is nothing else as lambda prime on x prime, because uh, our prime fields are functions of x prime. So. Uh, I will use the red one, maybe it's a little bit better. Let me try. So, L prime. So this is lambda prime, again, x plus delta x. Uh, this is lambda L prime on x plus uh, e mu L delta x mu uh, plus dot dot dot. And this I will write as L on x plus uh, L prime on x minus L on x. So I added and subtracted the Lagrangian density uh, plus e mu L delta x mu plus plus. And uh, this uh, expression here is according to my definitions is nothing else as uh, delta bar applied to this. Good. So this is a, uh, what we do uh, with the transformed Lagrangian, and then there is also here uh, a measure, an integration measure, uh, which is now changed, because uh, it's now d on x prime, and uh, in order to uh, understand how it's transformed, let me uh, do a change for coordinates, so I go from x prime to x, and as you know, uh, the differential then changes as uh, you have a, a Jacobian, G multiplied by dx, and the Jacobian here is determinant of uh, uh, dx prime over dx matrix. And uh, to understand how this determinant looks like, uh, let me write this matrix quite explicitly. So it has the following matrix elements, dx uh, zero. Minus one over dx zero, and here x prime uh, zero over dx g minus. 
minus 1, put up the dot, dx prime d minus 1 over dx hat d minus 1. Multiply by dx. Okay, so this is a determinant of such a matrix, uh, which is a matrix of dx prime over dx. So this is just a change of integration measure. According to the standard rule, actually I have to put uh, modulus of the uh, Jacobian, but you will see that uh, since I'm computing a two-exism transformation, this Jacobian uh, is close to identity, so it will always be positive in this aspect. So now, uh, if I substitute uh, this uh, expression for x prime as original x plus small variation delta x, then this matrix turns explicitly into the following one. So determinant of 1 plus, uh, plus derivative of delta x uh, 0 over delta x 0 dot 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 1 plus uh, derivative delta x d minus 1 over dx d minus 1. And uh, the matrix elements which are standing uh, outside the main diagonal, these all uh, elements are certainly of order of epsilon. For instance, if you look uh, at this uh, element here, it will be uh, derivative delta x uh, uh, 0 over delta x d, and uh, variation of the delta x0 starts from x0, so the leading term is uh, 0, not 1 as uh, here, as on the diagonal, but x0. So if you now would like uh, to evaluate this determinant up uh, to uh, the first order in epsilon, actually contribution to the first uh, order in epsilon will be provided only by the main diagonal. And this will be given by the following expression. So if I restrict myself to the terms of order epsilon, uh, they will give me just divergence d mu delta x mu dx plus dot dot dot, which I'm not interested in. So this is how the integration measure uh, looks uh, or changes up to the leading order uh, in the deformation parameter epsilon, in this transformation parameter epsilon. So this is order of capital M. Good. Now I can uh, combine all the pieces of uh, this analysis together and write an explicit expression for the left-hand side uh, of uh, assumed equality. this expression here. So original Lagrangian L plus uh, uh, variation of the form of the Lagrangian plus d mu uh, of L uh, delta x mu. And uh, that is all what we have at the leading order. And then uh, Mm, and then I have to substitute here the, okay, let me write approximately, uh, I substitute here the expression for the change of the measure. This is how the measure changes, and I multiply uh, at what I already have. And uh, uh, what I do, I again uh, perform a multiplication here and leave only the terms of maximally order epsilon. So this will give me the following uh, thing. So first of all, one multiplied by Lagrangian gives me original Lagrangian. Uh, then this expression here is of order epsilon, so I don't need to multiply it by these two terms, which are already of order epsilon, because they are variations. 
and therefore our contribution will be given by the product of this term by the original Lagrangian. And one will multiply the rest. So I will get delta bar L plus G mu L delta X mu plus L multiplied by D mu delta X mu. That is all what I have at the leading order in epsilon. And then you see that magically uh, things combine a bit and I get here the derivative D mu applied to the product. Lagrangian multiplied by delta x mu. So these two terms are combined now. You see that they are combined into the one derivative. D mu applied to a Lagrangian density multiplied by delta x mu. And uh, uh, the next step, what I will do, I will uh, apply, I will compute the variation of the Lagrangian. So variation of the Lagrangian happens uh, because, variation of the form of the Lagrangian happens because the Lagrangian depends on the fields and fields change their form. So I can compute this variation as a variation of the composite function. So first, I differentiate my Lagrangian with respect to field, and then I apply variation of the form to the field. And also, uh, what I will do, I then add derivative of the Lagrangian with respect to the derivative of the field. And uh, as I already told you, a variation of the form uh, does compute uh, with a space-time derivative, so here I can change uh, the uh, derivative and the variation, so derivative acting on the variation of the field. And uh, one uh, little step uh, is uh, to rewrite this term here as uh, in the following way. So I will write it as a Uh, minus d mu acting on d l d d mu pi i uh, delta bar pi i uh, plus derivative d mu acting on the product of uh, d mu pi i delta bar You see, this is an identity. If you open up uh, this derivative, uh, then uh, when derivative acts on the first term here, uh, it will cancel with this term, and then derivative acting on the second term on delta bar phi i gives me an expression which I already have. So this is just an identical transformation. But in fact, here you see uh, that this uh, delta bar phi i is an overall for these two terms and can be taken out of the brackets. You can write the expression in this way. And actually, uh, in this expression here, you recognize, you recognize the left-hand side of the Euler-Lagrange equations. So this is uh, an expression which I, will li I would like to call Lagrangian derivative, epsilon i. For Euler-Lagrange equations, if they are satisfied, then this uh, uh, Lagrangian derivative must be equal to zero. But let me not to put it to zero, it's just some expression which turns to zero if equations of motion are satisfied. In general, in general, it is there, and therefore uh, I'm obtaining uh, the following statement that uh, change, uh, so this is my original action, uh, or let me write it as a, here it's a, actually it's, this is S prime, uh, action which is uh, obtained after I change my fields, so S prime, into the following expression. So S prime becomes um, given by uh, integral uh, dx uh, original uh, Lagrangian. Well, let me write and probably uh, an expression right away for delta s. And delta s is a difference between s prime and the original s. So this uh, integral here is an original s. So delta s by definition is s prime minus s. So when I take uh, this difference, Lagrangian, the leading term, 
here, uh, which is Lagrangian, it will just cancel out. It will cancel out, and then what I will find is uh, here a Lagrangian derivative multiplied by delta bar, delta bar pi i, um, plus derivative de mu acting on this term here, and in addition, I have this derivative here. So all together, this will give me a total derivative of the following term. Like this, uh, delta bar i plus uh, Lagrangian multiplied by delta x. And then the bracket is closed. So this is uh, our intermediate result. Now, uh, what we allow in the Newton's theorem, the difference between uh, the left side and the right hand side, uh, would be uh, just an integral of the total derivative of some vector uh, lambda mu. So this is d mu lambda mu. And therefore, uh, on the one hand, uh, we computed this variation that is given by this expression. On the other hand, it is given by integral of dx of d mu lambda mu. And these two, uh, by assumption of the Noether theorem, must coincide. If we are talking about the symmetry of the action, that precisely means that these two coincide. And so I subtract one from the other, and I obtain the following statement. Zero is equal to integral dx, epsilon i, delta bar, by i, plus d mu, d mu by i, delta bar by i, plus Lagrangian delta x mu, minus lambda mu, uh, integral, uh, such an integral must be equal to zero. And let me close the bracket. So this is the result of our uh, variational analysis. Now I should point out that when uh, you consider uh, the Noether theorem, uh, the integration volume here is assumed to be <coughs> to be arbitrary, and so uh, the vanishing uh, of this integral for arbitrary volume omega for arbitrary integration volume can be only possible if uh, the integrand which you integrate is zero by itself. For arbitrary volume, that is possible only if the integral is equal to zero. And this uh, gives uh, the statement uh, that there exists such differential relation. There exists such a differential relation. This is differential relation which involves uh, variations uh, of the form of the field by i and the variations of the coordinates delta x mu. And the final step uh, of the Noether theorem, uh, when it says uh, there are s cancellation laws, it means that these uh, objects, that these dynamical invariants of these uh, conserved quantities, they are conserved provided. Euler-Lagrange equations are satisfied. And uh, that means that if the Euler-Lagrange equations are satisfied, this, uh, this expression is valid all the time. But if the Lagrangian equations are satisfied, then this term is absent, because what is written down here is the Lagrangian uh, derivative, which is the left-hand side of the Euler-Lagrange equations. So if the Euler-Lagrangian equations are satisfied, we get a statement that uh, there exists an object. Let me uh, call uh, this object uh, G mu, such that on equations of motion, uh, it's actually a current, G mu. On equations of motion, this current uh, 
is divergentless. It has no divergence. So divergence for this current vanishes. Eu gnu is equal to zero. And finally, finally, if you now substitute here an explicit form uh, for the variation delta by delta bar phi i, and also for delta x mu, uh, where uh, the functions are x capital and phi capital, and you use uh, the fact uh, that uh, all the parameters epsilon m are independent, independent. So you can actually write this current as uh, g mu n epsilon n. Then uh, this equation, since all epsilon n uh, are independent, they will be uh, uh, valid for any n separately. And uh, if I allow myself to continue on this blackboard, I'll give you an explicit and final expression uh, for this uh, uh, currents. G mu m are uh, given by. Uh, I will put an, ex uh, an overall minus sign in front of this expression. Uh, this is a historical, uh, this is put there for historical reasons. So derivative uh, of the Lagrangian uh, phi i n uh, minus d nu phi i uh, x capital nu n uh, minus Lagrangian x uh, nu n plus lambda nu n. This is an explicit expression uh, uh, for a current corresponds to this index n or corresponding to this parameter epsilon n. And uh, for any n, uh, there is a local conservation law uh, which reads like a statement that the corresponding current is divergentless. And actually, this is an explicit expression. So if you know how your symmetry transformation looks like, if you know what, your, what transformation you are talking about, then you can identify what is F capital, what is X capital, you know your Lagrangian, and you know uh, uh, the corresponding uh, uh, term, uh, which is a total, uh, which uh, governs the total derivative obtained after you vary your action. What is important in this uh, theorem is that uh, the statement about symmetries has nothing to do with equations of motion. So first of all, uh, you have to verify that there are transformations which leave your action invariant up to the boundary term. And if this is the case, then you can use your noted theorem to write down explicitly an expression for the corresponding conserved current. And now I will show you uh, that this local conservation law uh, which is expressed as a statement about uh, the vanishing of the uh, derivative of this uh, local current, uh, can be uh, translated to the statement that there exist there are uh, quantities or there exist quantities which uh, do not uh, depend on time uh, during the dynamical evolution of the system. So basically, I want to explain why this local statement here results in the existence of quantities which do not depend on time. So these quantities are now defined in the following way. You take the zero component of the current, which corresponds zero direction, corresponds to time direction. I take uh, zero's component of the current, and uh, I integrate it over special directions. Uh, like this. And then my statement is, and uh, so you assume uh, that you have some hypersurface that denoted by B, uh, which is in a sense orthogonal to the time direction. And uh, if you 
take uh, an integral uh, over this hypersurface of the zeros component uh, of the current with an index n, and you assume that all the fields vanish at uh, this special infinity, so fields tends to zero when you go to uh, special infinity, then uh, the statement is that these quantities do not depend on time. Explicitly means that uh, time derivative of kn is equal to zero. And uh, this follows precisely from this uh, differential conservation law in the following manner. So uh, you will get an integral over b dx dj n zero over dt. But then you write down explicitly this conservation law here. This is d over dt of g zero n minus d over d x i g n i. So it equals to zero. So you can replace a time derivative uh, of zero's component of the current where uh, the remaining components. And so you get here minus, uh, no, plus, uh, why am I writing minus? So it's plus here. Uh, it's minus integral dx b uh, dji over dxi. So you get an integral of the total derivative, and if fields all vanish with infinity, well, you get, uh, first of all, an integral over the boundary uh, of this uh, uh, hypersurface uh, B, which actually tends to infinity, and so this is by Gauss Stradratsky theorem uh, is a <coughs> flux through uh, the boundary of DB at infinity, and if fields vanish at infinity, uh, then this integral vanishes. And this shows that you indeed find uh, the correspondent conservation law. Okay, so this is a way how the Newton theorem is proved uh, in the full generality uh, with a non-trivial uh, boundary term, uh, with a non-trivial boundary term, which you can have after uh, you vary your action. Any questions? It's been bothering me all the time. Mm -hmm. The theorem was discovered relatively late. It could have been discovered you know, 50 years before. What's your opinion? Why? It's difficult to say. I am not it's quite sure. It's, it's late. To me, it's also late. All this conservation loss has been known, and the fact that they are related with symmetries. Absolutely, yes. I'm also wondering why it is the case. Only in 1918, the theorem was formulated as, it's, as we know it now. Uh, I think it was uh, originated from the discussion of Eminota with uh, Klein. Yeah. And somehow he uh, triggered her interest to this subject. Mm. And eventually, yes, it's resulted in this uh, beautiful, uh, beautiful formulation. So the conservation laws are, are, were around a uh, long, long time before, but such a precise mathematical uh, formulation and this derivation really belongs to Nerda. Yeah, the funny thing is what people found by mathematicians, not by physicists. Exactly, yes. yes. Uh, and uh, there is also a funny story how people discovered this uh, uh, appearance of this boundary term. So the action is not required, strictly speaking, to be exactly invariant, but only invariant up to this boundary term. So people try to check uh, the invariance of the Maxwell equations with respect to conformal transformations. And there they saw, and this is the way how Bess and Hagen actually uh, found this term, they saw that in, in some cases there could be some boundary terms appearing and so on, and he starts working out and investigates this issue, and then he found that it's possible to have it there. And they, such terms typically appear when you talk, for instance, about uh, Bray's T symmetry or uh, supersymmetry, you always get invariance of the action only up to some boundary term. And this is the answer to probably your question. The importance of the boundary terms. They could be there, but uh, they don't spoil the main statement of the Nerta theory. And, and when the second Nerta theorem here? Second Nerta theorem uh, deals with local symmetries. And this is a, a 
another interesting topic where you allow these parameters epsilon n to be actually uh, space time dependent. And uh, uh, this, uh, uh, this is a subject about local symmetries and about, uh, uh, or if you wish, about so called gauge symmetries. And there, there is a famous second Newton theorem uh, which uh, tells you that uh, if you have such a symmetry with respect to local transformations, you don't really have the conservation loss. There are no new conservation loss, or no conservation loss at all, if you wish. Uh, no conservation loss. But instead, there are differential uh, relations between equations of motion. Not all equations of motion are independent, but there are differential relations between them, like, for instance, Bianchi identities. And this is related precisely to the subject of the second meta theory. But possibly we come to this uh, in the next lectures. In the coming lectures. Yeah. How, how important was it that uh, the Lagrangian depend only on the field and the first derivative? And what happened if you had the second derivative? You could extend. Actually, in the original Nurta theorem, she considered uh, she did not restrict uh, herself to the first derivative only. In her formulation, you can allow any number of derivatives, it will work. There is no problem. Jet space, yes, indeed. You introduce jet space and then you extend all these discussions to this jet space. Yeah, it, it goes. It goes. It's not important. Mm -hmm. You can drop you can drop this condition. What you will get, you will still get local conservation loss, but you will know you don't get the global one. This one. A local, I mean this equa uh, this. Uh, yeah, that's you will have. Yeah. You will not have charge. That's true. So existence of the charge is related to the boundary conditions. And if your boundary conditions is chosen in pro not properly, they will break the statement about conservation. You should always have this in mind. There's a very important question. Thank you. Thank you. In many cases, people just do not care about this. But in fact, you should care. You have a global charge defined as the integral of the hypersurface. Uh, boundary conditions. Your fields here must vanish at infinity. Or, for instance, uh, in many situations, uh, you deal with fields defined on a compact space time, for instance, on a circle, or on the interval. And uh, if, for instance, uh, the boundary conditions uh, are uh, not such uh, that uh, this integral vanishes here, then, of course, you don't have a conservation law this reason, global conservation law. That differential equations you always have, in this differential condition you always have. But global, not always. Any questions, any further questions? Uh, yeah? One more question is, if we just mm -hmm. consider the space-time variable, mm -hmm. that manifold, so can Nurture theorem be proved in a similar way? Uh, here, actually, uh, I don't, well, yes, of course, yes, sure, sure. You can consider uh, a generic situation where your space-time is not really Minkowski space, as uh, uh, will always, actually, this will not always be the case uh, in my lectures as well. Um, you can consider a more general situation where uh, your quantum fields or classical fields are defined on a curved manifold with a non-trivial metric, not the Minkowski one. And uh, then uh, you have, uh, of course, uh, to uh, modify the corresponding derivation, but you can derive the conservation loss, so it's no problem. Yeah. Uh, let me see. At a certain point, uh, we have to make a break, or we continue till the end of the lecture, or what, what is it? Mm -hmm. I can continue, I can continue. It's up to you. The more, the more I talk, uh, the more I talk, the more information I will give. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> if you would like.
like a break, we can have a break. It's no problem. No? Should we vote? Do we continue? Or we make a break? People strong, okay. Uh, let me give you one example. It's, it might uh, seem a little bit abstract, this expression here. Well, you need to know what is phi capital, what is x capital. It looks pretty abstract. Let me show you that uh, this expression contains uh, our standard conservation laws, which we know, namely conservation of uh, energy and momentum. Uh, let me show you that this is uh, indeed the case. Uh, let's start uh, from the uh, simple situation where we assume that our action is invariant with respect to uh, constant shifts of coordinates x mu. So, uh, actually, uh, I will write this as an epsilon epsilon mu are parameters of our transformation, and we just uh, assume that there is a uh, translational invariance uh, of our system. So our system is such that it's translationally invariant. So this expression here, so I'm transforming for the moment only coordinates, I'm not touching fields. So this uh, means that I can write this expression in the following way. I can write, uh, well, we know that according to our Derivation, I should represent this equation here as uh, uh, x capital mu n uh, epsilon n. So I have to uh, I understand what is this index n here. But it's very easy to see that uh, this is something which can be written in a way epsilon mu mu epsilon mu. And therefore, where index mu has the same meaning as n. And uh, uh, delta mu is a Kronecker delta. And this is something which is now becomes this x capital uh, mu uh, mu. Let's write it as And uh, since I'm not transforming fields, uh, this uh, yeah. At a certain point, I have to identify uh, the nature of the field I'm talking about. So I would like to compute uh, the corresponding uh, current. Uh, Uh, I would like to uh, compute it for the case of a scalar field. Mm -hmm. Take a scalar field, single scalar field. And the scalar field uh, is an object which, uh, by definition of what we call scalar, is an object which under coordinate transformations transforms in the following way. Phi prime on x prime is equal to phi on x. In general, uh, and uh, in our lectures uh, here, we will be dealing with a general case of tensor fields. So tensor fields, in general, uh, these are objects which might carry a certain number of uh, indices, upper indices, say mu1 and so on, mu, uh, uh, mu n, and a certain number of low indices, mu1 and so on, mu m. And then uh, under general coordinate transformations, uh, tensor fields, are the objects which transform in the following way. Uh, dx prime mu1 dx prime mu n over dx alpha dx alpha 1 alpha n uh, dx prime mu1 d over dx prime mu m uh, x Beta one and x beta m are multiplied by phi uh, mu one uh, sorry alpha one and so on alpha m uh, beta one and so on beta m on the point x. So these are tensor fields. Objects with one index up, like this, by mu on x. Transforming in this way is called vector. Thank you. This is a vector. And the object with one index down is called cover. 
an object with two indices down and symmetric in mu and nu. It's a symmetric tensor of the second round that has the same uh, transformation modes, for instance, symmetric of the space time. So this is, uh, would be uh, an object which transforms in the same way as a metric. And maybe you know also what would be uh, the transformation law for this object. You knew one index up, one index down, like vector and covector. It's a transformation law here for vector covector together, linear operator. Transformation law for linear operator. It's like a matrix, matrix synthesis, meaning one up and one down. Good. So, scalar is the simplest example, simplest possible example of a tensor. The guy which carries no indices at all, and then according to this transformation law, there, is, there are no derivatives, no derivatives here, and simply you have pi prime and x prime is equal to pi and x. This is what we call scalar field in theoretical physics. Okay. Um, so for the scalar field, uh, since uh, uh, the variation in the Noether theorem is defined as a difference uh, between phi prime and x prime and phi and x, and for the scalar field, it simply vanishes. Therefore, this uh, phi capital I n vanishes as what well for a scalar field. So we have only matrix, uh, we have only this element x, but we don't have phi. And therefore, we can straightforwardly write down uh, an expression uh, for the corresponding uh, uh, So in this situation, index uh, m, I told you, it has the same meaning, uh, in fact, as an index mu, they are on equal footing. And in this case, uh, the uh, current which we obtain, I denote it by letter T, so this is the same, or well, this is uh, analog of what I call G mu n, but now the index m uh, is replaced by mu. According to this formula here, uh, this becomes, and I think I also changed the null sign, so I'm, no, I'm not changing the null sign, I, I'm just using this expression, this uh, term is absent in our case, and I get minus minus gives me plus. And so, as a result, we get the following expression. G mu phi, uh, G mu phi, uh, minus delta mu nu, uh, multiplied by original Lagrangian mass. This is how this current T mu nu uh, looks like. And uh, the conservation law, which we expect to take place from the Noether theorem, looks like this for any nu running through the indices 0, 1, up to T minus 1. What is this object here? Stress energy tensor. Stress energy tensor. So this is how stress energy tensor for a scale of field looks like. Stress energy tensor. This is also an autonomous tool for calling energy momentum tensor. Energy momentum tensor. And actually, in my lecture notes, I write stress, stress, stress. Canonical stress energy tensor or canonical energy momentum yeah. tensor. So you can read this in my lecture notes. Thank you for your remark. You are very uh, Straight to the definitions. Stress or strength? Stress. Strength, not stress. Yeah. Uh, no, no, no. Is Here is stress. 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 Energy. Stress. Simply stress. Sometimes people call it simply stress tensor. It produces a lot of stress for you when you learn it for the first time. <laughs> I'm coming to that. Uh, excuse me. I'm coming to that. Thank you for your remark. Yes. This is what is called canonical. This is what you immediately get 
if you apply this formula here. Yes, um, you see uh, in this derivation already, from this derivation, you see that indices mu and nu are sort of on different footing. While one index is really uh, responsible for taking this divergence, and the other one just numerates how many symmetries you do have. This is shift of time, this is shift of space, directions, and so on. So indices mu and nu are on, uh, not on equal footing in general. Now, uh, you can do similar derivation for the case of the vector field, uh, vector or covector, but in that case, uh, you have to take into account that there will be a non-trivial function phi capital. In that case, you will get something here, something non-trivial here. Let me skip it. You can see it in my, in my notes, how this is done. Um, let me now maybe comment on the case of the angular uh, momentum tensor, and this will be interesting, and this will allow me to talk about uh, this question about symmetry of the stress tensor. Now, uh, for the case of uh, angular momentum tensor, uh, to derive uh, the corresponding quantity, uh, I consider uh, the transformations which are infinitesimal rotations of space-time. And uh, these infinitesimal rotations of space-time, so infinitesimal uh, delta x mu goes to x mu plus infinitesimal rotation, where rotation parameters epsilon mu nu uh, form an anti-symmetric matrix. The matrix which satisfy this condition here and uh, uh, in that situation, uh, you can see uh, that uh, the variation of uh, x, which is given by this expression here, epsilon lambda nu, it can be uh, rewritten in the following way. It can be written as sum over independent uh, transformation parameters namely epsilon mu nu for mu less than nu uh, of uh, x mu delta mu lambda minus x mu delta mu lambda epsilon mu nu. Uh, you see, the point is that uh, in the Nutter theorem, you have to represent the variation of x uh, uh, is a variation which involves only independent parameters. But if I have an anti-symmetric matrix, only its upper diagonal consists of independent variables. And this is a way how to write the variation. You can check that if you <coughs> open everything up, then these two terms, you pro terms produce for you exactly the same expression due to anti-symmetry of epsilon mu nu. And from here, you can read uh, that your object X capital now takes uh, the form uh, of having one index up as before, but now uh, it has uh, two indices down, and uh, this indices mu and nu is a combined index for my previous index n. Because now you have many rotations. Yeah, if you have uh, a d dimensional space time, how many rotations you can make in d dimensions? In general, d. D minus one over two, right? And uh, uh, that's why now uh, this index n runs d d minus one uh, d multiplied by d minus one over two values, and uh, they are parameterized by indices mu and nu. Now two by two indices mu and nu, uh, and uh, therefore x is our matrix given by this expression here. Now you have uh, just to plug it in here. Uh, for a scalar field, phi capital is still zero. And uh, uh, assuming that the action is invariant with respect to such uh, space-time rotations, uh, you will obtain uh, the following expression for uh, m lambda mu nu. And this quantity here, which is called, well, you will tell me how it's called. Uh, D nu phi. Uh, x nu minus d nu phi x nu uh, plus plus l uh, x 
x mu delta nu lambda minus x mu delta lambda mu. So this is a straightforward application of the Lambda theorem. What I have done, I just take this x capital here, these two indices in the u, plug with this expression, and uh, the second term with Lagrangian originates from this term here. I assume that the action is exactly invariant, so there is no boundary term. And uh, I'm getting a tensor, which is called a tensor of angular momentum. That is what we call tensor of angular momentum. And as before, for the stress tensor, this guy is uh, explicitly conserved due to the Nerta theorem, which means uh, that its uh, divergence equals to zero on the equations of motion. The equations of motion are satisfied, and the divergence from this object is equal to zero. Now, if you look at this expression for um, this tensor, you uh, can see if you combine this expression here with uh, the derived expression for the uh, stress tensor, and you see that this expression for the angular momentum tensor can be uh, written in a very simple way. Uh, we are stress tensor as x nu e lambda mu minus x mu e lambda mu. So what you need, you need to isolate one term here, this guy here, and the other one which contains x mu, and these two together give you one copy of e, and this term here, together with this one, gives you another copy of e. And so you end up with this expression here. Very good. So, in fact, uh, you build up uh, the next uh, concert, uh, local conserved quantity, the next integral of motion, uh, by knowing only uh, the stress tensor. And uh, let me see. Um, Let me see. Now, uh, what I will do, I will uh, not do the derivation, but I will just make a statement that if you uh, repeat absolutely the same computation for the vector field, then uh, for the vector field, uh, say phi is an index number, uh, for the stress terms, uh, you will find absolutely the same expression as before for a scalar field. Uh, with just only one difference, here there will be index number over which you get some. Otherwise, the expression will be completely the same. And uh, for the angular momentum tensor, although you will get a bit different expression, uh, which still can be written uh, with the help of that stress energy tensor, and explicitly for vector, for vector, it will look like uh, m lambda mu nu is equal to x nu e lambda nu minus x nu lambda nu so far is the same but then you will find out an additional term which will look like e lambda phi nu phi nu minus a derivative of the Lagrangian with respect to lambda phi nu uh, phi nu uh, an expression which is uh, 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 explicitly anti-symmetric with respect to the synthesis mu and mu. So this is an addition uh, to angular momentum tensor related to the fact that you are dealing with vector. And uh, now, if you uh, would like to verify the uh, conservation of uh, this tensor, so if you would compute derivative d lambda m lambda mu nu, first you have to compute the uh, derivative of this expression here, and you see that if you differentiate this expression over lambda, uh, once lambda 
can act on the uh, stress tensor and the corresponding derivative will vanish because stress tensor is conserved according to our discussion, it's conserved by itself. But that can happen, the derivative also acts on axis. And when it acts on axis, you will get here, uh, one case, so you will get uh, lambda becomes index mu and it gets down, so you will get t mu mu minus, and then when it acts on this x mu, uh, you will get uh, the metric t lambda mu and index lambda gets down, you get t mu mu. So you get the difference uh, between t mu nu and t nu nu. So stress tensor with indices uh, transported. And uh, from here you can conclude uh, actually that if stress tensor is symmetric, if it is symmetric, so if this is equal to zero, then this piece here, addition to this term, is conserved by itself. It must conserve by itself if stress tensor is symmetric. And this expression here is typically known as a spin part. Spin part is, is something which corresponds to transformation uh, properties of your object with respect to space-time uh, transformations. Uh, for vector, it's one expression. For tensor, it's another one. For scalar, it's epsilon. So this object is related to spin spin of the field. It's also known under the name polarization tensor. Polarization tensor. And so in the case, if stress energy tensor is symmetric, then uh, you get another interesting conserved quantity, which is related to the spin of your field related to the way your field transforms under space-time transformations. Now, we come uh, to another interesting point here is uh, how uniquely all these quantities are defined. For instance, how uniquely uh, this expression here uh, for the current is defined. It appears that in fact uh, this is not uh, object, uh, this object is not uniquely defined in the sense that you can modify the expression uh, for uh, this current without spoiling uh, the local and global conservation laws. And this is done in the following way, which is actually, uh, this way it's done, is called improvement procedure. And I will explain the word improvement in a second. Uh, Although it's also that it doesn't matter. Now it doesn't really matter. Okay. Um, improvement procedure. Uh, improvement procedure uh, is the following uh, statement. So if you have uh, a conserved uh, current, that means the current which satisfies uh, this equation here, then uh, you can modify it by adding to it a total derivative, like uh, d which index I use, let me see, d mu chi mu mu n, where chi is an arbitrary uh, function of fields, uh, which is anti-symmetric in this indices mu and mu. then uh, this conservation law will not be spoiled because uh, you see if you add uh, on this addition, on this improvement term uh, with the derivative d mu, you will get zero because derivatives commute and they are multiplied here and this indices mu nu are paired with an indices of an anti-symmetric object and therefore you get zero. So the conservation law uh, can be changed by adding up some function uh, which is anti-symmetric in the indices mu and mu. And sometimes it is possible uh, to start from the canonical uh, stress tensor. It might happen that this stress tensor is not symmetric, but there is a possibility to actually improve it 
in a way that it will become symmetric. That is not always possible, but sometimes it is possible to find such an improvement term that the stress tensor becomes symmetric. And when it is possible, and you know that you can change your T in such a way that it becomes symmetric, then my considerations here imply, uh, must apply, and uh, I can uh, conclude that in that case the spin part will be separately conserved. This is not always possible. As uh, we will see later on, maybe tomorrow, that for instance for the Dirac uh, field, for the Dirac particle, it is not possible to find out an improvement term such uh, that the stress energy tensor becomes symmetric. And therefore for the Dirac field, the angular, uh, the orbital part, this is called orbital part, and this is the spin part, orbital part, the spin part for the Dirac field, they do not separately conserve. And you can never improve the Dirac tensor in such a way that the orbital part becomes conserved. And so for the Dirac field, for instance, this is not conserved and this is not conserved, but when you add up them together in the total stress energy tensor, then it appears that it becomes a conserved form. For the Dirac field, this is... Yeah, spin is something non-relativistic. Let me put it this way. This is an explanation. If you would like to see spin, you should consider very slow uh, moving electrons and you can understand. That you, then there is a possibility for you to go in the rest frame of the electron and then you are in the rest frame and you get... You can see massive vector field. What you can do to the rest frame? Yes. Yes, for the, for, 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 for the case of the vector field, of massive vector field, uh, the things are better. Because uh, transformation laws are not of a spinner with respect to the Lorentz, but with respect to the, uh, well, with respect to the Lorentz, transformations are different, it's a vector field, and uh, for that case, uh, things become, uh, actually, no, even for the, well, Massive or massless, this has nothing to do with that. Uh, in fact, uh, for the case of the vector field, in spite of the fact that you can uh, separate the spin part from the orbital part, the notion of spin, strictly speaking, even for the electromagnetic field, does not exist. Because you can understand physical degrees of freedom of electromagnetic field only if you impose a gauge. So, for instance, you fix the Coulomb gauge. But the Coulomb gauge uh, makes the transformation properties uh, with respect to the Lorentz transformation to be related to those which are related to the, uh, well, to make the, it makes them non-trivial because now you impose an extra condition of your field, right? You impose oh, whatever, whatever you prefer. You can impose the Coulomb gauge or you can impose the Lorentz gauge. In any case, what you do, you impose one condition on this index here now. And uh, for instance, if you want to talk about this, no, this I don't want to discuss. I want to discuss only physical degrees of freedom. Then I go to the Coulomb gauge. I know that it's not gauge invariant condition. And that essentially means that I cannot so easily transform this index with respect to Lorentz transformations. Lorentz transformations are not compatible with the inquisition of the Coulomb gauge. So, uh, if you want to understand what will be conserved here for the case of the vector field, let me just say right away that what you will see here is a conservation of helicity. Helicity is a quantity which will be conserved. Helicity. The same for the Dirac field. Helicity is the right quantity to be conserved instead of spin, instead of what we call spin. Projection of the uh, spin on the direction of motion. This is what is conserved for the case of the Dirac field. Yeah, so 
I don't know exactly how to formulate it in terms of uh, uh, homology theory, but I can tell you exactly what is the condition uh, for the stress energy to allow uh, asymmetrization. Yeah, no, yeah, sure. All these functions which I made are local. Uh, and the condition is the following, that if you have, if you are given some tensor, T menu, and that you evaluate its anti-symmetric part, then necessary and sufficient condition for this tensor to admit improvement to become symmetric is that the difference between T menu and T menu must be a total derivative, total divergence. So it must go like, uh, uh, it should be minus, or whatever, it should be like zero on some omega rho mu mu. There should exist some omega rho mu mu such uh, that uh, this uh, equation here is true. It must be a total variance. And actually, I was planning to solve today uh, an exercise about this. If you take, for instance, a standard Maxwell action, and if you apply canonical procedure of deriving the conserved uh, stress tensor for electromagnetic field, the expression which you will get will not be symmetric with respect to the change of indices mu and mu. But you can work out uh, what is the difference, and you can see that you can always represent it in such a form. And if you know this function omega here, you can explicitly construct what you have to add to t to make it uh, uh, symmetric. And this addition is called bell infante or this tensor, which is symmetric and constructed from originally non-symmetric tensor, is called bell infante tensor. And if you wish, I can give you this procedure explicitly. So let's see. Uh, Energy momentum tensor has uh, another capacity in gravity theory. So it's in which there is gravity theory. Yes. So it is uh, derived yes. uh, as the function of derivative with respect to the yeah. metric. And in this case, it's always symmetric. Absolutely. How yeah. it is uh, connected with your with your arguments? Uh, with my arguments. So, so we, we can always yeah. get a symmetric. Uh, not always. Momentum. Not for the Dirac field. Act well, for the Dirac field. Uh, if you think how uh, Dirac Hermione is with gravity, you need field bias in this case. Yes, field bias is not symmetric. You cannot with the metric. It's exactly. Metric. Exactly. It's exactly. Like more, exactly. More so for the Dirac field, you agree with me. Yes, cool. yes. But otherwise, otherwise uh, it should uh, always give a symmetric uh, uh, Yes, temper. yes. And exactly. So in gravity, there is an extra way. Uh, well, gravity gives you another way to define the stress energy tensor. And in that case, of course, it comes out symmetric. So what you have to do, you have to uh, consider your theory on a non-trivial gravitational background. So you put non-trivial metric G mu, and you define uh, now your Lagrangian uh, to be a function of uh, your fields, and in addition of the metric G mu. And uh, uh, you still define the action in the same way. It's an integral of the scalar field, which depends now on g mu and phi, and uh, you can show uh, that uh, stress energy tensor then can be defined, uh, which is symmetric one, uh, can be defined in the following way. So 2 divided by square root minus square root of g, where g is the determinant of this uh, non-trivial metric, variation of the action, or variation, sorry, variation of the Lagrangian density with respect uh, to the metric g mu. In that case, it comes out symmetric. Now, if you don't know anything about gravitational theory, and you are just in the framework of the Noether theorem in the flat space time, then, of course, you don't know. And for the Maxwell theory, the stress energy tensor will appear to be non symmetric. Uh, the one which you derive from the gravity is symmetric. And the difference between them is precisely an improvement term you need to add. That's very simple. That is how it goes. And so I was planning to make this exercise to show you explicitly that you can do that. You can find such a position. Uh, for the case of fermions, things are different because indeed, in order to couple fermions to gravity, you need to you combine, and then, of course, things become different. 
Now, uh, well, I think you get the basics uh, of improvement and we can discuss it uh, for the case of the uh, uh, vector field or Maxwell field when it comes to the exercise class. Let me make just one or two maybe remarks. Uh, there is a further way of improvement of a symmetric tensor. Suppose your tensor is symmetric already, but you can still further modify it by adding to it uh, such a thing. You can add to it uh, d rho uh, d sigma w uh, mu rho mu sigma, where uh, this function w uh, mu rho mu sigma has uh, the same symmetries as a Riemann tensor gravity. So uh, that means that it's anti-symmetric with respect to the first pair of indices and it's anti-symmetric with respect to the second pair of indices. And uh, mm, it's uh, symmetric if you commute these indices and pairs. Then uh, you can see uh, that this will not spoil the conservation law because of the symmetry properties. So if you differentiate this with respect to the mu, it will vanish. Uh, so it will not spoil the conservation properties. But sometimes uh, making such an extra addition, an extra improvement, uh, this expression actually is symmetric in mu and mu, uh, making such an improvement, what you can reach, you can reach the tracelessness of the stress tensor. So sometimes by this improvement you can make the stress energy tensor to be traces to satisfy this condition. And this is related, when this happens, uh, this is related to the fact that sometimes uh, particular theories, uh, Poincare invariance, which is a invariance with respect to shifts and with respect to Lorentz transformations, can be further extended to a bigger symmetry group, which is called conformal group. So, possibility to improve your tensor up to the point where uh, its uh, uh, trace vanishes signals the appearance of conformal, so-called conformal, conformal symmetry. I'm not sure, I think I have to... Uh, it can be done only for magnetic fields. Yes. Uh, if you uh, require that this equation here holds at any uh, space-time point locally, then this is conformal invariance. If you require that your integrated tensor trace vanishes, then this is scale invariance. Scale invariance is weaker. Conformal invariance is stronger. And I hope we will talk about conformal symmetries in the exercise class and maybe the next lecture. Thank you. I think that's it.